So it's great to be here, and it's great to see so much attention being given to security in the Kubernetes space. Um, there's been a lot of common themes in today's talk, which is, which is great, I think. Um, I would like to start by talking about uh, a particular organization that we have worked with at Red Hat, uh, who has actually taken the opportunity in, with adopting containers to improve security. Um, there's a link here. I don't know if slides are going to be shared later, um, but if you all want to listen to them talk about their DevSecOps journey, there's a link to the YouTube presentation. Um, so we've talked a lot about tools. We've talked a lot about policy, uh, capabilities that are available to you. I'm going to try and tie all of these things together and add another element, which is the human element, because you really can't make all of the shifts that are required to get the most out of uh, containers and orchestration and to get the most out of securing that environment without some cultural changes. A lot of the security teams are used to doing things in a particular way, and doing security in Kubernetes really means that they need to think they're shifting a little bit, and they need to think about some newer tools and some newer ways of doing things. And this particular organization really took that to heart on their container journey. Uh, one of the key things they did was they had uh, their uh, head of the application development team, their head of ops, and their chief of cybersecurity all committed to this project and worked together to define the use cases that needed to be met in their deployment. Um, they actually happened to be deploying on AWS. Uh, so they, they defined their use cases, um, and they had a war room. They worked together on an ongoing basis as they were working through this deployment. Um, it required, of, of all of the teams, the, most, the team that had the most change in their thinking and their way of working to do was the security team. And this is a case where, uh, the, again, the chief of cyber defense was committed to making that change. He decided his team needed to understand the CICD pipeline, how the developers worked, and his team needed to learn to code. So they really did implement security as code. And when we think about defense in depth, and again, a lot of common themes here, I'm just gonna be a little bit more prescriptive. We really believe strongly you have to do all of these elements of you have, to, you have to tackle all of these elements of security and have all of them in place for your Kubernetes, uh, to have a secure Kubernetes environment. And we're gonna kind of walk through some of these. We're gonna start by talking how you control application security. We've, we've heard a certain amount about this from our different speakers already. Um, just kind of at a very high level, what are some of the key elements of a container pipeline? Just like when you build other types of application, a number, some of your code is going to come from outside sources. Maybe you used to download jar files. Now you're downloading container images that you're going to build your, your custom container images with. And some of that content is going to be content maybe that you can trust, and some of it might be unknown. Um, how many of you today in your organizations store your custom binaries in some sort of registry or image, okay? So you need to absolutely do the same thing for containers. Luckily, many of those enterprise tools that you use to store your war files, your ear files, will also store container images. Um, and then, of course, we want to manage the CI CD process, and we'll kind of talk through that as we go. So trusted sources, this is something that's come up a couple of times during the talk. Um, you, want to, you want to be sure that when possible, you pull uh, base images and runtime images that you're going to combine with your custom code from a source that you trust, that the images are signed, that there is visible data about the known vulnerabilities it, that may or may not be present in that image. There's some sort of a health status. How old is that image? Is it the most recent thing available? Um, and you also want to know how quickly those are rebuilt. Uh, you want to store any of the images that you're pulling from external sources, trusted or untrusted sources, in an on-premise private registry. 
there are a couple of things that does for you. One, if the external repo goes down, you have a copy that is always available to you. But that's also the place that you're going to implement a lot of your security policies around managing that registry. So in addition to scanning during the pipeline, which has been talked about a number of times, you want to scan images as they're pulled into your private registry. Another thing that private registries do for you, and that I see as a pattern at a number of our enterprise customers, is you can be more permissive for your development team than maybe for your production environment. And you can do that through the access controls in your private registry, or you can doing, do that by having more than one registry on premise. And in fact, what I commonly see is very tight controls, kind of loose controls on the developer registry, very tight controls on a production registry. Nothing gets into a production registry that hasn't been scanned, that hasn't been signed by the team that's you know, allocated in the organization to review images. Um, also, it uh, was mentioned earlier when uh, Michael and Liz were talking, they mentioned admission controllers. So you want to think about that not just for what's getting into Kubernetes, but also what are you pulling into your registry. So you want to maybe uh, blacklist and whitelist external repos. And again, you can be more permissive for your development team and have tighter controls for production. One of the things that uh, we've done in OpenShift is we've implemented something called image streams, which helps you track the status of images that you've pulled from external registries. So as those images change upstream, new vulnerability is discovered in them, or maybe a new version is released, you can use image streams to kind of monitor those changes. And if you've been able to fully automate or even partially automate your CICD process, image streams will help you pull down newer images, push them through your pipeline, and then again, you decide how many automated or manual gates you have in place during that CICD process. But that addresses one of the key things, right? When you use external images, how do you know when something new has been discovered and when a new patch is available? Even if you're scanning regularly, so you have vulnerability data, how do you know when that Kubernetes patch to this most recently discovered vulnerability, that big one, you know, how do you know when that's available so that you can rebuild and redeploy or patch your, patch your clusters as needed? Um, so CICD, of course, has to include security gates. One of the things that I hear a lot, um, even before we get to security gates, is that automated testing is a big challenge for a lot of enterprises. How many of you feel like you have enough automated testing in place? Kind of pretty small. So this is one of the real challenges, right? We talk a lot about the benefits of the immutability of your container images and that you know, again, so if I think back to that original customer, one of the reasons they say that, that containers gave them more security, no SSH is allowed into production in their environment. They always rebuild and redeploy their container images, their applications, and that's the way to do it, right? But doing that means that you have to have an approval process in place and you have to have the ability to respond quickly when you need to update those images. And that's, that's one of the biggest challenges for large organizations. We all have a lot of code that's been around for a while and those tests haven't been automated. So in some cases, if you can't do it for your more legacy apps, do it for your newer apps, do it for your greenfield focus there. Um, and the legacy apps, maybe they just have a slower deployment process because you don't have as much automated testing. Um, similarly, this was also mentioned earlier, but, but again, this is for, for our customer, this was key. Uh, their chief of cyber defense was so excited that he could break the build if a security policy or vulnerability was found, you know, policy violated or vulnerability found during the, during the CI process. A lot of developers kind of get aggravated by that idea. <laughs> so, but the question is, right, do you want your security team telling you after, you know, months of work just before you deploy that it's no good because there's something they disagree with? Or do you want to find out as early in the process as possible? And so, again, there's a culture change not just for the security team, sometimes for the developers too, right? They both kind of need to find a way 
to come together and hash out how are we going to do this together? How are we going to agree on the policies that keep the organization safe and help the team move quickly, deliver the applications that drive business value quickly? Signatures. Um, big value in signatures as well. And again, you know, we all know um, vulnerabilities are discovered every day. So some of the other things to think about as you, especially working with, again, uh, private registries. If you are, have tagged an image as having a new known vulnerability, you can use admission controllers to prevent that image from being newly deployed. Maybe it's already running and you need to patch it and update it, but you don't want any new instances deployed. You want to be sure that you never allow containers to run as root unless there's that special case that maybe requires it. That's something that, that we also run into a lot, that, that folks who have started playing with Docker, where the development teams have just kind of played with Docker in, on their environment, built those container images, they haven't thought through kind of what that means. And we've allowed, all of us have allowed developers to write apps that require root privilege for years, right? So this is a change, too, that, that the team, the organization, has to work through. But you want to use tooling that we'll talk about in a minute, was mentioned earlier, too, to help you prevent that. And again, make sure you uh, rebuild and redeploy and that you have set up an automated pipeline that makes it easy for you to do that. Linux containers run on Linux, right? The OS really does matter here. And uh, there was a brief reference earlier to some of the capabilities that are built into Linux that help to isolate containers from each other and isolate containers from the kernel. You see them listed here in red. You want to take advantage of those, right? And, and security teams don't always know about these things, so there's some education, right? Some of the security teams haven't had to get involved. Maybe they know SE Linux. But they've always turned SE Linux off. Where's Dan Walsh? Did he leave? Hey, Dan, what's the question? Or what's the tagline? Every time you turn SE Linux off, Dan cries, or something along those lines. So, so, so that said, there are a lot of applications that, don't under, that they don't understand how to work with SE Linux. That's one of the reasons companies turn them off. So you turn it off. So you want a Kubernetes platform that knows how to work with SE Linux and that makes it easy for you to use SE Linux in your Kubernetes environment. So security context constraints is something that uh, the Red Hat team built into OpenShift early on and have contributed to Kubernetes as pod security policies. And that's how we help the Kubernetes admin use all of those built, those, those Linux security features, the, the container isolation features, to the best advantage so that the developers and the app, the, the app team don't have to worry about it. You use a security context constraint or a pod security policy to ensure that no container is allowed to run as root. If you have, by default, if you have a subset of containers that need privilege, you can do that. You can set up a, a special pod security policy. Um, you can use the SE Linux context, seccomp, all sorts of things that you can do here. Furthermore, um, as soon as pod security policies are as mature as the OpenShift uh, security context constraints, we will migrate to them, and we're working with the community uh, to get to that place. We've talked about some of these other elements that are up here before, but again, I want to be more prescriptive and say that you must configure your Kubernetes cluster to use RBAC. Ideally, an RBAC that allows you to connect to the identity provider of your choice so that you have the ability to centralize that user management and leverage those, those user management tools that you've been working with for some time. Any access to the master from, should be uh, over TLS. Uh, access to the API server should be X509 certificate or token-based. 
Ensure that your secrets are encrypted in transit and at rest, and etcd now allows you to do that. So configure it. Um, you want to have logging, monitoring, and metrics integrated into your Kubernetes environment. All of them are key parts of a full security solution. And this is also a place where your security team understands the value of logging and monitoring. And so you have a nice, easy win there with your security team. And you want to use project or, or Kubernetes uh, namespaces to create isolation within the Kubernetes cluster for the different applications, right? So you've got isolation at the OS layer. You've got isolation within Kubernetes. And in a little bit, we'll talk about network isolation. So again, logging and event auditing. Um, you want to make sure that you are logging all login, all user login, all master events, all API calls. You want to separate, you want to control who has access to which logs, right? That the admin should be able to see ops logs, but not application logs necessarily. Sorry, admins can see all logs. I have a I have an ongoing conversation actually with a prospect in India where the admins are not allowed to see any application data. So that's on my mind. Um, so we're, we're trying to figure, you know, it's, it's a new regulation. So if you think about um, uh, GDRC, right, the EMEA general data protection requirements, I guess in India they have something that's maybe even a little bit more stringent. And so they actually don't want their admins to see any of the log data from their applications. Now this is the first time I've heard that. That's pretty unusual. Um, yeah, so it's, it's kind of, it's, it's in my head today. Um, but in general, you want app owners to see their data and the admins to be able to see all of it. And you want to do log forwarding and continue to use your SIM system. And again, that makes your security team happy. They understand all of that. So network defense. Another thing that, that was brought up earlier was different use cases around uh, clusters, right? Single cluster multi-tenancy, single cluster single tenancy. So Kubernetes requires a, an integrated, an SDN, right? You need to, to add an SDN to your Kubernetes cluster. You'd only want to use a flat network if it's a single tenant cluster. And if your workloads on that cluster all have the same level of security requirements. Otherwise, you want an SDN that supports multi-tenancy, network multi-tenancy, where each Kubernetes namespace or project namespace gets its own virtual network ID, and they can't talk to each other. They can't see each other. They can't talk to each other. You can have multiple pods, multiple nodes in a namespace, and those can, can see each other and talk to each other. But between the namespaces, they can't. But where you really, did I go backwards? No. Yes. Where you really want to go is to Kubernetes network policy for a multi-tenant cluster, right? So this gives you the most fine-grained control. It's also newer than the network multi-tenancy. So this really allows you to be much more specific. If you need to allow communication between namespaces, you can specify the port and the direction of traffic that's allowed. If you, even within the same namespace, if you want to really tightly control which pods can talk to each other, you, you, you want to use network policies for this. So this is, in fact, really becoming the most popular um, networking security option for our customers, our enterprise customers. We've also been hearing a lot about service mesh. Um, OpenShift has service mesh in tech preview right now. Uh, I don't know that I need to repeat a lot of what Jerry said, right? It gives you uh, the ability to encrypt trans east-west traffic, which is something that the security teams have really been looking for and previously, you know, have required sometimes the adoption of additional tools into your OpenShift cluster. Um, and you also get the PKI as a service but you also get traceability, visibility into your east-west traffic. Again, in ways that security teams look for, have been wanting, and until service mesh has, you know, kind of now with these open source projects, this is something that you can deploy without having to buy a new tool. You can deploy into Kubernetes and again, make your security team happy. 
storage, right? We can't forget about storage. There's tons of plugins, storage plugins available uh, to work with Kubernetes, NFS, AWS Elastic Block, GCE persisted disks, Gluster, iSCSI, Ceph. Um, so you wanna be sure that you think about how you're gonna secure your storage as well. Persisted volumes can be mounted in any way the resource provider supports. Read, write once, read, write once, read only many, read, write many. For block storage, uh, OpenShift uses SE Linux to secure the root of the mounted volume, uh, making sure that that volume is owned by and only visible to the container it's associated with. And for shared storage, you can manage access with the group by adding the group ID of the persisted volume to the supplemental groups of the pods. You can tell I was reading that, right? It's the only way I can remember all of that. <laughs> um, API management is also key. So in addition, when you've got microservices-based apps, you've got a lot of APIs perhaps that you're making externally visible. So you might wanna think about adding an API gateway uh, to, your, to your cluster. Um, and the only reason in this case I say might is that in fact um, there is some overlap with Istio and its related components and API gateways. So it could be that you may get much of what you need uh, by adding service mesh to your cluster. But some of the things to think about with an API, API gateway, um, if you're looking at API gateways, look for one that gives you um, application and account plans that let you restrict the access to specific endpoints and methods. Um, app plans that let you set rate limits. And if those rate limits are violated, you get an alert that might be an indication of a DDoS attack, right? So API gateways can be a really good thing to add to your cluster. And then last point, um, there's been this terrific explosion of really interesting security tools for containers and Kubernetes. And you do wanna take a look at them just as, as our friend from Forrester was talking about. The cool thing about Kubernetes, right, is you've got open APIs and open standards that you're working with. And with those two things in place, that really does give you the opportunity. You're not, you're not talking lock-in now and you're talking extensibility that as long as uh, the tooling you're interested in understands containers, if they haven't built an integration, you may want to invest or you may just wanna nudge them to invest. But we are seeing organizations, you know, who've been in the, in the security space for a long time, CyberArk's a great example, where they've really um, moved into the container space. They've figured out what do they need to know about containers and, and really taken that on. So they're a long-standing tool, a long-standing vendor in this space. And then we have folks like Aqua who are newer, but just took advantage of the fact that so many traditional security tools didn't understand containers. Um, and, and so you have a great set of solutions out there to evaluate. Ideally, of course, you wanna get the most you can out of the capabilities that are built into the Kubernetes platform you choose. Turn them on, take advantage of them, make sure they're there, secure your pipeline. So control your application security, defend your infrastructure, and extend your, your deployment with security ecosystem as needed. Thank you, Kirsten.